This Week in Startups is brought to you by Walker Corporate Law, a boutique law firm specializing in the representation of entrepreneurs. Visit them at walkercorporatelaw.com. The Hartford. The Hartford knows that being a founder means having to make a lot of choices and that you've got enough on your plate without having to worry about getting the right small business insurance. That's why they provide specialized products and insurance solutions that can be tailored to meet your needs. Find out more by visiting thehartford.com slash twist today. And NetSuite by Oracle, the business management software that handles every aspect of your business in an easy to use cloud platform. Get NetSuite's free guide, seven key strategies to grow your profits when you go to netsuite.com slash twist. Upcoming launch events. Get your free founder pass or purchase a VIP ticket for Launch Scale in San Francisco, October 7th and 8th at launchscale.net slash tickets. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Welcome to This Week in Startups. Every now and then, a story will break. A journalist will break a story like Theranos or, in this case, Topto, uh, and some controversy and some lesson for Silicon Valley emerges. That story is about Topto screwing not only their investors, but also all their employees out of equity. In Silicon Valley, we have a covenant, a sacred covenant, that if you join a startup, if you invest in a startup, you've taken massive risk. And because you've taken that massive risk, you get the chance to have a lottery ticket. Those lottery tickets do not pay off 80% of the time. They pay off roughly 10 to 20% of the time. In other words, You spend five years of your life at one of these companies, you put in 500K, 50K, whatever you put in, expect to lose it 80% of the time. Expect to get it back and maybe have a push 10% of the time. And then maybe in some rare instances in the 10%, one in 10 chance, you might get some huge return. Could be an Uber level return, could be a Robin Hood, could be Calm, could be 50X, could be 5,000X. We don't know. But that's what keeps people coming to this town. That's what keeps people from, instead of taking a government job, instead of taking a job working for a big, huge company like Amazon in year 20 as opposed to year two, Google in year 20 as opposed to year two. This is the social contract construct of Silicon Valley. If you come here, you might just get rich. It's also, by the way, entrepreneurship and American excellence at its best. Equity and capitalism has been the foundation of most of the great things that have happened to humanity, not socialism and certainly not thievery. The person who broke the story is Amir Efrati. He's been on the program, I don't know, 10 times? A few. Yeah, between five and 10 now. You're in the probably six, seven club. We'll get you the 10 jacket. Uh, Congratulations on the story, Amir. This is a really important story. How did this story happen? Um, Well, when enough people feel aggrieved... uh, you know, word gets out mm. um, one way or the other in this uh, in this town. But just to jump on what you were saying earlier, I think there are a lot of disputes that happen around compensation related to the risk that people take to join a startup. And you and I were just talking about Uber before mm. the show. Yum, yum. You know, the the key thing about Uber and the the kind of unrest that we saw there in 2017, a lot of that was due to people feeling screwed over Hmm. on comp specifically, um, on equity specifically. And- uh, Wait, you're saying that the the harassment claims were in some way driven because people felt they weren't being compensated well? No, I'm saying that the harassment claim uh, ignited this broader Ah. situation. There was already unrest building inside of the company. It was was a powder keg. No, not some. Many, Got many it. people, disgruntled people. And it was a powder keg. All you needed was to light the fuse. And Got someone it. did. Susan did. Right. And so um, there were a lot of comp practices that were uh, unusual, mm. sometimes questionable. Um, some would say- What's taking... an example of that? So an example of that would be- uh, oh, I, Actually, I'm an investor in the company. Obviously, everybody knows that. Yeah. If you didn't know that, I would tell you in the first five minutes of meeting you. But uh, it's my standard joke. It's a dad joke. Um, but uh, I wasn't aware of this. Tell me. Yeah. So an example would be- Um, looking at the offer letters that people are receiving or the kind of recruiting pitches that they're receiving. Ah, Okay. Saying, well, the average equity bonus Hmm. is X. Got it. Not saying that, well, the median... Got it. Because it might be bonus. an outlier. Like a no, 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 bonus might be huge. Right. There but somebody di- ranked exactly. a file, but so they did the average. It's not even just Emil, but th- there was there was a huge sort of ramp up. And by in, the way, he probably in, deserved in, it because he did a great job. Yeah. 
yeah, raise a lot of money. He's a, a maestro in raising money for sure. He's a machine. Um, so there were a lot of people who were who were given information that was incomplete on purpose. Okay, right? so but they gave him the average and they didn't say, is this the median? Right. Exactly. So exactly. Whose fault is that? Well, it's it's it created bad feelings. But. It did create a lot of bad feelings. And and again, I'm not saying that it's I'm not saying that it's uh, legally wrong. Right. I'm just saying that if you make hmm. people feel like you know if you upset a lot of people, they will turn Got on it. you. So people thought they were going to get the average. Let's say the average was a thousand, but that included somebody getting a billion shares or something. Sure, exactly. It, it screwed up the average. Yeah. And the median was actually more like five hundred or Tiny. something. Yeah. Not even. Yeah. A hundred. Whatever. Yeah. So they so, just felt like it was 10x off. So so my, my broader point is that there are a lot of conflicts that come up here because sure. people take these risks. You have, um, God, I remember Zynga before Zynga went public. You know, oh, Mark Pincus so cl- clawed back, you know, a bunch of equity from people. So the- in that specific instance, there were two people who were like co-founders and he told them, uh, you've been here for two years. You got like two more years of vesting, but it's not worth us to have you here. You haven't really earned it. So therefore, we're going to fire you, right? And you'll get nothing, or you can stay and get half of whatever you had. Which, yeah, I, yeah, I don't know how many cases it was, but it, it, it was, was only two it, people. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. in the case, and I talked to Mark about it. I won't say about our personal conversations. Sure. We're personal friends for a long time. Um, but that was the stupidest thing he's ever done, and he knows it. Well, because yeah. the social contract is. You hit the lottery. Right. That's like somebody saying we right. do a whole pool here in the office. We all win the lottery, but because I bought the tickets, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to give you half, and half's better than none. Right. It's kind of a jerk move, and he knows that, and that's why he was hated for a long time in this town, and I think it was some serious reputation damage, and I think he apologized to those guys. I don't know if he made it right, but yes, comp is don't mess with people's money is right. the message. And, and in the case Don't of mess to- with people's paper. In the case of TopTal, it, it honestly is one of the more unusual stories I've ever come across. Um because you you have Andreessen Horowitz and and a few other, you know, uh relatively experienced angels like Adam D'Angelo who put money in this company. The founder of uh Core. Core. Yeah, yeah. I mean these uh, are an as early sophisticated Facebook. as sophisticated companies. This is somebody who made their money on Facebook under right. the social contract. Sure. Started Cora put his own 30 or $40 million in the company, I yes. understand, and yes. has the social contract with his employees. Yeah. So he knows the social contract. Right. And, and you know, the, the con- speaking of contracts, the physical documents that mm. were used here were very typical. Um, they standard made a, boilerplate. Yeah, standard boilerplate. Um, it actually, I forget the name of the, the Safe? law firm that it came from. Oh, okay. Um, I think it was actually the law firm that we that we interviewed for the story, um, and and uh, you know these convertible note documents that were used in TopTal with the investors, uh, and and you, you mentioned safes, which are an even more kind of uh, I, I suppose dubious founder friendly uh, uh, document. Um, yeah, they were very common, and again, they they just say, well, in the neck in the in the funding round that comes next, yeah, at that point when there's a valuation established, you investors will get. X amount of equity mm. at this cap. So the cap uh, capped amount of valuation at Top Tal was ten or eleven million, ten and eleven million dollars. So basically, which is exactly what I yeah. guessed with our next guest, who's on the program, who's an employee, that that it was probably ten million at the first yeah, round. Yeah, yeah, exactly. 10, ten million and then eleven million. So the investors, in theory, should have fifteen percent of this company, Got it. which gross revenue last year was like two hundred million dollars with a thirty percent um, margin. With thirty percent take, they get thirty percent of the two hundred, so that's sixty right. million in actual revenue. Right. If they have a thirty percent margin, so I don't actually. So, is that I don't know clear? if it's. I don't know if it's as simple as that. Um, I heard the average. Yeah. Take rate, the average cut they took, because just top tell sure. matches developers with people running projects. They Correct. take thirty percent on average of the cost of a job. So if you and I, if you're the developer, and I'm the person who wants an app made, and I pay top tell a hundred, you get seventy. Top tell gets thirty. Right, right, it, and okay. and it's a it's a really interesting business model. They, a lot of people refer to it as uh, geographic arbitrage, where you're getting engineers yeah. in Brazil or other places and paying Marking them a them certain up. amount. Yeah, and then and then taking uh, taking the rest. Um, but you're getting paid for aggregating that inventory, yeah, and sorting exactly. through it and cleaning it up, just like Airbnb Great or Lyft or Uber. It's but a it, but it's a but it's not a super liquid giant marketplace. You no. know, these are vetted people who are yeah. supposed to be good. This is the, supposed to be the one percent, um, and that's why uh, clients like it and it and it yeah. works primarily with with smaller companies. Although they do have some bigger yeah. companies, but they're at the forefront of this wave of 
quote unquote, remote work or distributed sure. workforces. And the list is very long of companies or startups that are that are mm. pursuing distributed workforces. Yeah. Um, the number grows every day. Um, Automatic, you know, which does WordPress is an earlier, earlier example, but there's so many more uh, coming. Yeah. And I mean, Slack, many of them are. Yeah. A lot, a lot are making a the, lot this of, decision. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, it's a very, it's a company in a very interesting space that's that's you know growing. Yeah. And so you have this amount, uh, you know, this giant success, and then you have all these really pissed off uh, employees and investors who thought they were going to get rich. And so, th for the employees, the contracts that they have stipulate that in the next funding round, mm -hmm. when there's a funding event, you will get X. You know, the wow. company will determine you will get X percentage. It, you know, there's a percentage, percentage of the company. Percentage, uh, percentage of the outstanding shares, or certain percentage of, of the of the company's shares. Yeah, got it. Okay, um, one percent, ten percent, whatever. Point two percent, or point three percent, or whatever it is. Um, and so you have a lot of people who who you know uh, are unsophisticated, um, who maybe didn't run that by a lawyer because they've never done that before. Maybe they live in Chicago. Maybe they live in Florida. Maybe they live in yeah. Texas. Maybe they live in Oregon, Montana. They, you know, the company itself is a distributed workforce. There's no office right. for top talent. It's Everyone's not like you're going to the HR department on the third floor right. and they sit you down and get a cup of tea and have a long discussion with you to explain RSUs, restricted stock units versus regular, vested, warrants, whatever, strike prices, 409As. They're not going to explain all this to you. Right, and so they took advantage of this. Well, they, they took advantage of this. And I, I don't know that they actively took advantage of this, but certainly a lot of um, even even employees here. Let's be honest, employees who are in Silicon Valley um, generally don't understand stock compensation. They it's don't a take huge problem. it super seriously because it's a lottery ticket, right. and then they take it seriously once once you hit the lottery. Once you <laughs> once or you know, deal. like so. In the case of Uber, it became pretty clear that was like one of the instances as an angel investment it was like we knew in year two, yeah, this was going to be a unicorn. It was very clear to all of us when you saw the growth. Or of the, of the, the second, or the second you use the product, you're like, this has to exist. Magic. This Magic. is the most incredible thing ever. Yeah. Walker Corporate Law. You've been there with me since the beginning. Thank you, Scott Walker. Walker Corporate Law is a boutique law firm that specializes in the representation of entrepreneurs and founders. And their lawyers have 10 to 20 years of experience, and there are no junior associates getting on-the-job training. They offer all kinds of great services that you would you know, normally think about when you're starting a company. But they also do things like mergers and acquisitions, licensing agreements, and your privacy policy and your terms of service. You want to work with Scott Walker and his team at Walker Corporate Law because they encourage fixed fees. In other words, they tell you, hey, you want to do this? It's going to cost X. You want to do that? It's going to cost Y. And you don't have to get that sticker shock when you get your bill from your attorney at the end of the month. No, Scott Walker does not want to do all that billable hours nonsense and then get you uh, some inefficient product. No, he wants to be efficient. He wants to get done quick and tight and do it right. So email my pal, Scott Walker at Scott at Walker Corporate Law. Scott at Walker Corporate Law. Make sure you tell him Jason sent you. Or you can visit him at walkercorporatelaw.com. His number, 415-979-9998. 415-979-9998. Ninety-nine, ninety-eight. How cool is that? That he puts his phone number and his email right out there for you to email him at Scott at WalkerCorporateLaw.com. Thanks again, Scott, for supporting this week in startups. You're the longest-running sponsor, I think, along with Squarespace. So I really appreciate that. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. They made these promises, um, and then all contingent, all contingent on the, on next, the next funding. Equity funding, right? Just like the safe agreement. So, for people who don't know, there's a convertible note. A convertible note is a loan with an expiration date. And at that expiration date, at the, typically the way a convertible note is set up, at the expiration date, which is two years typically, you either have to give the money back to the investor with interest. Usually, it's some de minimis amount, four, five, six, seven percent uh, over the two years. Or convert it into equity at the cap or a discount, whichever is greater to the next round. Mm -hmm. um, and with the safe, there is no conversion date. Right. Unless you do a side letter like we do at our firm that says within 24 months, this will convert into preferred equity at this amount if nothing else happens, which is how we protected ourselves. Right. So this was a safe. You saw the note. You've seen it. I've seen it. Yeah. Yeah. And you have to assume that Andreessen Horowitz, one of the top five funds active in Silicon Valley right now in terms of you know, profile, the people who work there, and the assets under management, 
did not read this document? These are handshake agreements. This was done at the time. 2012 was when these investments were made in, in TopDal. TopDal started, you know, basically mm. like nine years ago. And at the time, Andreessen Horowitz was just like throwing money at all mm. sorts of deals, trying to get into the fray here. And, and this had Valley. to be the first year of Andreessen Horowitz, or second year, uh, right? Maybe when did they found? They're third, 10 years old now? third or something. Yeah, yeah, so no, it's probably the third year because they're were, 10 years old. But yeah. they were doing a lot of these like super early uh, C deals at the time. And right. so I doubt that Not it was reading ever, the documents. I never read the documents yeah. in the first five years when I was a Sequoia scout. There you go. And then I started reading them. And then I was like, huh. And then I built my entire firm around a new set of documentation that took what Sequoia got in later rounds and Benchmark got, and I applied it to the seed round. And and these convertible notes were, I'm told, uh, supposed to, uh, they were basically, um, uh, they used to be used for bridge, you know, uh, yes. loans, essentially, essentially that, that startups would take. And then they they, they they wanted to kind of reduce friction, right? And, and, and use them. You can give a convertible note in a one-page document without even talking to a lawyer, sign it, give it to somebody, here's 500K, we'll, we'll deal with it, we'll... We'll do. We'll paper all this officially at the next round. But I'm loaning you the 500k. In this case, right. it was 1.5. But they didn't have a conversion date, so this has never converted. So the hack is the founder of this company, co-founder, the co-founder Tasso Duval. Yep. Who is a wacky character? I want to get into that. He's colorful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, highly unethical. Garbage is what I would describe uh, the way you're treating your employees and investors. But putting that aside, my own personal opinion. Uh, he knew what he was doing. In your research, this was explicitly done by him in some premeditated way, or you don't know? Because it seems to me this is a premeditated, I am going to hack the system. I did this note. He said, don't expect to ever have a board seat. He kind of had an anti-investor that was a bit later. Gestalt but. later on. You know, I, I, it was interesting. So, look, I, I can't I can't use the adjectives that you use. I just right. I I'm a commentator. Sort, you're a journalist. I, yeah. I just have to sort of stick to what what we the know. Facts. I was just actually thinking the other day that this company was founded not long after the instant messages came out with Mark Zuckerberg um, and I think Adam D'Angelo actually uh, coincidentally. Um, talking about the Winklevoss twins and the project that he was doing for them and, and screwing them and yeah and and I think and I think there's just a lot of um, there, certainly when that came out it you know among some people around here it just kind of um, uh, help people re- remember how important the the beginning of something is, mm. and um, and so it, it's just funny that 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 this company was founded kind of shortly after that th- those IMs came out. But so what you're the saying is the no 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 I'm not saying it. I'm no, not no. suggesting anything. I'm just saying it, it was interesting that no, that, no, that was a in parallel. that period. It's yeah. an interesting parallel. I think there's some synchronicity there because people forget um, Zuckerberg changed the corporate structure of Facebook, moved the equity and moved the project into another LLC or something and took his previous founders, I guess, Eduardo and- um, Dustin Moskowitz. Yeah, and all those and basically screwed them and then restarted the cap table in this new company. That I'm not familiar yeah, with. Yeah, it's, it's, it's all in the story. And then he basically, he's like, yeah, no, Facebook's this new entity over here. And what we worked on was Facebook, you know, the book face or whatever, you know, like some other, you know, thing we had done. And- okay. That's interesting. That that is not something that yeah. I, I recall. This, I, recall, I mean, when yeah. you move a corporation from an LLC to a C corp or an S corp to yeah. C corp, you have to basically do all the paper again. Right. So it's kind of like a moment in time you can do a little bit of shenanigans. So what I'm trying to get at here is he created an LLC. Right. He created an LLC and limited he, liability corporation, which right. he's was, the only he, member sole of. Sole proprietorship essentially. Yeah. yeah. He he owns he owns all of it. Um and then he started you know, as he was starting this company with this with this guy named Brendan. Um, Beneshot, who uh, is his co-founder, and they worked on this together. Yep, um, founded uh, it together in a in a in a dorm room, actually, or in a in a, a, a college room. Um, and the you know the allegation now there there are these dueling lawsuits between these guys now, and the allegation is that uh, you know Brendan says that that Tasso Duval, the CEO of TopTal, um, just promised him, you know. Handshake agreement. You're going to get, you know, X percentage. Seventeen percent. Right. Uh, when 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 we do the next round, we don't need to put it in writing. It's just you and me. Like yeah. we're, we're in this together. We're bros. Um, that never happened, mm-hmm. right? So certainly, Brendan uh, feels feels quite slighted by that. Um, 
And, and a lot of employees uh, do as well, especially the people who are in management, kind of higher level at this company. Um, and inter interestingly, a lot of people have left TopTal off of their re resumes or their LinkedIn uh, uh, profiles, um, I think based on the, the kind of experiences that they had there. Uh, but it is a you know massively successful company, and a lot of people uh, have benefited tremendously uh, from it. And and so that's not to say that every employee... wait wait a lot of people have yeah Aside sure from Tasso who sure a lot of people who let's say let's say you work for TopTal uh, in another country oh a developer and you're getting yes. paid not even a developer even if you're part of the company mm. right even if you're in the TopTal family you're making a decent good salary. money compared to your you know Got peers it. in your area so. Um, so it's been a you know it's been a good going concern for a while. So I guess um, I guess the point is that you know it becomes this massive success, and and now a lot of people have realized okay there is not going to be another equity event here. There's not I'm not going to get my shares because it's year nine. He would have converted if right. he was going to exactly. And, and, and his point is and he yeah. and he says we don't need to. We're not going to. We don't need to. We're a successful business. Why should we fall into the Silicon Valley trap as he sees it of just raising money to raise money? And and not being as efficient as possible in your capital allocation. Which is allocation. nonsense. He doesn't have to raise another round. He could simply convert the equity That's and true. give everybody their shares. Very true. And Very be, true. Um, which is which is what Notion, this hot you know productivity yes. app startup, just did. They had they had a convertible note. They didn't have to convert. They're actually doing really well. Yeah. They say that they're actually doing net 10, profitable. 20 million, yeah. but they say that they're not profitable now. Right. They don't actually, but they're like, you know what? It's the right thing. We're going to convert, convert and, yeah. and, and take a little bit uh, of more equity funding while, while we're at it at like almost no dilution. Um, so TopTal is, is you know, you would think that this is an outlier. When we first sat down before you started taping, you said this was like highly, highly unusual. And in some ways it is. Uh, However, the, I called one lawyer on this, a startup financing lawyer, and this one lawyer is like, oh yeah, I have another case just like this happening mm. right now with another company that took you know, early convertible note uh, you know, funding and then never converted because it's done very well, it's profitable, it doesn't need to, and the founder doesn't want to do it. It's going to remain an LLC. And, huh. the, and, and so the investors just sort of have to suck it up and hope that the founder does the right thing. The, well, not no, or that there's an acquisition, or that the, the founder ah, sells the in company. In a change of control, that exactly. it would convert. Exactly. But in the meantime, this horrible human being, Tasso Duval, who screwed his investors, screwed his employees, uh, and screwed his co-founder, the trifecta there of just being a horrible human being, um, he can take the $200 million in revenue. Let's assume they have a 20%, 30% margin. He can just take $50 million a year as a dividend to himself for the next 10 years. I don't know the theoretically. Tax. I don't know the tax implications of that, well, but he, yeah. when he, you're an LLC, you pay one time tax. Yeah, he he, he a dividend. He appears to have a very good life. And to to the extent that people who have worked with him say they don't see a reason why he would change it. He he's got, you know, a really really good life. He's in control of this company. He's got, you know, a lot of money to play with. Yeah. Um, and, and well, it really so, depends yeah. on that two hundred million. Is that two hundred million gross revenue? Yeah, that's that's the, gross. That's the marketplace gross. That's the marketplace so sixty gross. million in coming in fees to them, and they have two hundred employees or so. Yeah, I, it's in the story, but yeah, yeah, I think something like, like hundred fifty yeah. or two hundred employees. Yeah. So yeah. that puts them at um, yeah, uh, that will put them at twenty million in cost base, probably sweeping. Remember, there's no there's no office. Some of these employees no, no, are not in the U.S. Thirty at least fifty yeah. percent margin on that sixty million. Yeah, because on average they're taking thirty, maybe twenty five. So it's 50, let's say it's fifty million, and they spend twenty million on the two hundred employees, twenty thirty million in profits. I you he know, could be sweeping I, per year. I know you're saying you, you. I know you think you know what the take rate is. I think it might be a little bit more complicated than that, and the net well, it's revenue variable might be higher. Oh, really? Yeah. So yeah. sometimes it might be fifty percent because they're reselling developers in the Ukraine or in it depends. Uruguay or Paraguay who are getting paid yeah. 30 grand a year and they're charging them out for 200. We don't we don't know, but yeah, there's a lot of uh that that's definitely the sense that the sense that I got. I mean, again, it's a highly successful company um doing very very well. So so the the you know, now we're at this impasse mm. where nobody's written about this company before, barely anything at all about yeah. this company. Uh, other than a couple of interviews here and there. So people so, started whispering, just so people understand how yeah. journalism works, and you guys are not part of the fake news trying to get clicks. The information has no advertising. You're not mm -hmm. trying to get clicks. You get to spend weeks on a story like this. I assume this took a month to come together, two, three, four weeks. Uh, yeah, you do it over time. Uh, I, I shouldn't get into too much on the timing, but um, th this took a little while. Over 100 hours, let's say. Yeah. 
of your long. time. Clearly over 100 hours. No, no. 50? No, not that much. No. Okay. Not that, not that much. Okay. I just thought uh, there had to be a lot of sourcing here. But I guess if people are yeah. doing a dump to you and you're getting the documents, that's like, that's the dream scenario for a journalist because you have the evidence, you have the document, you can read it. Sometimes it takes a while to to convince people uh, to to do that. Uh-huh. It's This was not necessarily a situation where people were kind of frothing at the mouth trying to talk to us. You sort of have to convince people that, you know, it's a worthwhile story. It's super unusual and i guess the the motivating factor for some people is just putting it out there so that other people who may join this company just uh. know going into it what the reality of the equity situation is and yeah. not to assume that it's a tip because when you look when you go to the website you pull up the website it looks like a typical Silicon yeah. Valley startup. And Dreesen Horowitz is there when you like click on the They about put their page. logo there to troll they them. They put the logo the, they put the Dreesen Horowitz logo there. They put like a few of these, you know, good angel investors there. They literally put them on the website yeah, even though they're it's screwing on the website. them. So wait a second. This, yeah. That is a level of trolling that is can only be deliberate. What do those <sighs> other investors think? You certainly without saying specific ones because you no, don't well, you said yeah. Dreesen Horowitz Gave no comment. Right, right. But you must have some back channel. What's the back channel from investors without saying a specific yeah, investor's name? It, look, in general, uh, they don't like this. Yeah. I mean- the, Don't uh, like it. Uh, th- these, these are they investors- They own 15% of a company that's right. worth $700 million? Possibly, yeah. Uh, certainly on principle, this is a disconcerting thing. For some of them, like Andreessen Horowitz is not hurting for- returns right um so they don't necessarily need to start a war what did they put in a million you think of the one uh, five no less 500 less. 750 they uh, were the co-lead no it was smaller it was a smaller check it was definitely yeah. smaller check All right. so let's I, say it was in the tens of thousands oh I okay think. so yeah. it's fifty thousand uh, for every dollar put hold in on. hold on actually i'm not a, sure it's a 70x investment yeah so a dollar equals 70 a thousand equals uh, seventy thousand. A million it, it equals seventy million. It could have been. A, it could have been a hundred or hundred thousand or more. Um, now that I think about it. But regardless, they, they're not gonna. They don't need to start a war. It would with only the be seven million dollars for a seven. Yeah, if that was the case. Right. So it's, it's not. Yeah. It's, it's not injuries and Horowitz level money. But certainly, there's a principal issue here. Yeah. Exactly. So for for some of this, a principal issue. I think the concern was more on the employee side. And you you spoke to a former employee yeah. who who felt um, short. Thanks to your story. Yeah. Scott uh, uh, Ritter, who comes up next on this podcast. Yeah. yeah. So so there are there are some of those folks who are who are starting to talk. And I think I think again the motivation is. Um, just make sure that other people who are coming into it, who, who again are not sophisticated, don't have lawyers, are not going to run these contracts, these employment contracts or employment agreements by lawyers. Just make sure they know what the reality is. That's all. As a founder, you need to make a lot of choices and you've got enough on your plate without having to worry about getting the right small business insurance. Not every company needs the same level of protection and you don't want to be wasting your money. That's why the Hartford provides products and capabilities that allow you to select a solution so that it can be tailored to your specific needs. The Hartford has a dedicated team focusing specifically on the needs of small businesses, and they've done so for over 30 years. They were the first to do this, and they're the best at it. They serve over 1 million small businesses across the United States. That's a lot when you think about it. And the Hartford knows that technology is integral to your business, and when it fails, the financial impact can be significant and your business could be sued over these errors. And most traditional liability insurance policies are not designed to respond to financial claims in a lawsuit. No, but the Hartford can help you protect against these and other risks, and they can do it in a way that is right for you as an individual. So find out more by visiting the Hartford.com slash twist, H-A-R-T-F-O-R-D, Hartford.com slash twist, the Hartford.com slash twist. With small business insurance from the Hartford, the Bucks got your back. The Bucks got your back, people. Get back to work. Let's go. You said there was another, uh, in the attorney you spoke to, said he had another case of this. Yeah. I assume that was on the safe document, specifically not a convertible note. It was note. a convertible note. It was yeah. a convertible. Yeah. In this case, was it a safe or a convertible? Convertible note. Convertible. Yeah. Okay, so they're both convertibles. Correct. Um, and so is there now action being taken by the investment community to protect against this? And then what does this say to the LPs? Because I was just talking to some serious LPs um, from a, who are in a friend of mine's fund, and we, this topic came up amongst a couple of LPs, and I was curious their take. I'm curious. 
you know, this is this is more relevant to like super early stage folks or angel investors like yourself. Cowboy um, Ventures, Y Combinator. Like if the yeah. LPs could, who are funding us, limited partners who right. fund and back our funds, right. think that we're dipshits sure. and we'll sign documents that sure. our winners never convert, that's a pretty bad sign. Like for the people who are the angels in this, yeah. Yeah, again, this is a very, this was a very, this was and is a very common practice for a lot of the bigger venture firms, including Andreessen, I'm sure for, for, for more traditional investments, I think a lot of them require the company they invest in to be a C corp as opposed to an LLC. Yeah, of course. They just require that. Yeah. Um, so again, once Delaware you're- Delaware C for the win. Once you're, yeah, once you're in the, the kind of, um, uh, Big big leagues, yeah. Um, then I think there are more safeguards. But, it, but again, this is a great cautionary tale to just remind people, you know, there's a lot of trust involved here. There are a lot of handshake agreements. But if you don't add certain clauses into your legal contracts, you put yourself at great risk and peril. So, yeah. you know, try to be cognizant of that. I guess it's definitely an issue. I know when I started my angel investing career, one of the companies did incredibly well when I was a Sequoia scout. And I made 21 investments and three became unicorns and two became, you know, $100 million plus. Uber, what were the other two? Data Stacks and Thumbtack. Three mm. of my first seven mm. were unicorns. Thumbtack is still? Yeah, still unicorn okay. territory. They just raised another yeah. 50, I think, at 1.x. Um, yeah, and in one case, one of uh, a breakout, one of my breakout companies, um, I own some very nice chunk of equity, maybe put in 50K, which was the tip, 25 or 50K, which is the bullet you typically did as a Sequoia Scout one time, no pro rata. Um, and I don't have information rights. And they won't tell me the share price or how many overall shares there are. So I don't know what percentage I own. I don't know how much I've been diluted. I know nothing. Mm. And I just thought to myself, this is why angel investing has a bad name is because of this lack of information. Now, all of our founders, when we sign a contract with them, in the contract, we have information rights down to Google Analytics, Stripe, et cetera. Like if we want to see the underlying data, we have the ability to do that. And we require 10 monthly updates a year. Now, mm -hmm. we're not taking a founder to court because it's a bad look um, for an investor to sue a founder. That's really only happened, yeah. I'm trying to think in my life, yeah, aside from cases. Bill Gurley with yeah. Travis and Theranos with that dipshit Mm -hmm. stupid like non VC private equity fund that put a hundred right. million and I forgot right. their name, but they sued. Right. I can and that's the two I can remember. It almost never happens. Yeah. It's rare. It's rare. And and look, I mean I, I'm sure you have any investors taken legal action yet? No, you they think can. they will? I, I don't know if they I don't know if they can. Right. The contract is what it is. Yeah. I I think unless there's certainly was... you would want to do it just to put your foot down and take a shot. Yeah. Because I... in discovery, if there yeah. was explicit Here's the thing. If you do discovery, now I'm probably, this guy is such a <laughs> Tasso Duval that he's probably deleted everything. I mean, this person has zero ethics. I know you can't say that. I'm making it a little uncomfortable as a journalist for me to say that. But this person's behavior is so unethical, I think, that they would have deleted everything. But in discovery, you're going to find stuff. I bet you this person, just like Zuckerberg, you know, True Color came out in yeah. AIM and in the Yahoo Instant Message or whatever he was on, AOL Instant Message. I bet you this guy Tasso Duval, like, talked about screwing people. Uh, again, yeah we, yeah, we we won't know unless it unless there's Ugh. discovery. I, I think there may be some discovery in the cases with his co-founder. That'll settle real who, quick. Uh, yeah, I, I would imagine it would settle, but I don't know. Who knows? Um, th these things get. I mean, so what's it, what's really interesting? Actually, I have to be honest with you. Reading the lawsuits between Tasso Duval and his co-founder are actually quite fascinating because um, if you read the the lawsuit that Tasso filed against his co-founder. What was one of the allegations is around the co-founder uh, alleged to have basically used the company as a as a piggy a bank. Piggy bank. But what's interesting about that is that he, it started off as a request for a loan to deal with some personal issue, and then I I, I just sort of was thinking in my mind, I wonder if the co-founder felt so aggrieved that he was like, well. I'm about to just if, take my some cash. if my co-founder is using this company as he wishes, 
I built this thing. Sure. Why don't I just use it you as know, my piggy Take bank. a vacation or whatever. Um, so he again, put a vacation on his credit cards or something is the claim? Uh, that's the claim. Yeah, that's the claim. Um, that's, th- a, that's a spurious claim. And it's also like $10,000 in costs or it's, some nonsense. It's, it's a little bit more than that. So Bre- uh, Brendan Beneshaw, the co-founder, uh, uh, according to the lawsuits, did pay back a good portion of the amount that he that he took from the company. There's an allegation that there's more that he needs to pay back. But it's actually a, a really interesting set of lawsuits. But um, but yeah, I think I think this story is uh, we. I cannot tell you the reaction we got to this the story was insane. From who? Um, the investment community, all, angels, founders. All this is one of these stories that um, it's infuriating me. I it, mean, I'm on fire about the story. It, it just. Um, I think I think I calculated it. It, it did 13 times. Uh, it got 13 times more. Uh, but better performance, I, I would say, as a story in mm. terms of um, uh, in terms of the kind of attention and engagement that I expected it to have. Yeah. So it, it it hugely overperformed because um, uh, because it it cuts to this really uh, interesting uh, uh, print, you know this really interesting kind of foundation of of Silicon Valley and the early stage investments yeah. um, that maybe people people take for granted, and so. Uh, so yeah, so I don't know where things are going to go from here, but uh, we write a lot about private tech financing. That is like a big th- part of what we sure. do. We were writing about super voting shares very, very early on, char- kind of charting which you know founders are doing what, constantly looking at the tussles between founders and investors and how that changes over time. Explain I know super you have, voting. Yeah, yeah I, I know you, you can. I know you have a lot of thoughts about why Combinator and the rise of convertible notes as funding documents yeah. for for early stage startups. And I'd, I'd be curious for your thoughts sure. on on this because it, it does seem like the investors who um, really were bending over backwards to to kind of um, empower their founders. Yeah. Um, uh, I think from your perspective, maybe went a little bit too far. But but talk 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 about you know since you've been doing this for so long, yeah. I'd be just curious kind of what you think about um, how investments have changed over time. Yeah. Um, so, and I appreciate you coming on to talk about this. I know that um, you're busy and I do appreciate the the hard work you guys do at the information. Everybody should subscribe if you haven't. It's only 40 bucks a month now. You don't have to pay 400 a year. You can pay 40 bucks a month. And the right. story was but so if good. You, I if you're younger, if you're mine younger, mine had lapsed, a... and I just signed up again. So that, kudos on that. You can tell Jessica that, like, I resubscribed because we, I was like, Uber stories, whatever. I'm like, this story I need to read. I forgot. We have a for for younger for younger folks. We have a half off. Oh, do you? Uh, deal. Yeah. Oh, great. Use yeah, yeah. the uh, code JCal. No. no, I don't know if there's a code. Or not. But anyway, it's well no. worth supporting. And I think the kind of journalism you're doing over there is really good because I'm getting like Bloomberg is like emailing me this poor woman at Bloomberg. I was just admonishing her for like every story she contacts me about is like salacious and i'm like you're bloomberg it's embarrassing for everything you do to be like a salacious like oh, they do good work at bloomberg they do generally but like i'm like if you're emailing me three times three different stories and all three of them are about parties it's like can we just can you at least write a profile of one of my companies like to do something positive in tech um anyway um so when the convertible note came out people didn't like it for a number of reasons on the investment community um, so this is just technical. One, you don't have a share price. Why is that important? Well, when you report to LPs, mm-hmm. you give them the share price mm-hmm. and you give them your percentage equity. So the limited partners think the California Retirement Calpers or Harvard or Yale or any of these folks, you send them a report every quarter. They have an investment committee. They want to know what price you paid for shares. So when these things first came out 10 years ago, Fred Wilson, Ron Conway, a lot of people didn't like them because you didn't have a share price for your LPs to see. Also, things like qualified small business, which is a tax code that gives you a tax break on the appreciation of stock you hold for five years. You get like the first $10 million federal tax free. It can be like an incredible um, incentive to invest in startups. That doesn't start until you have a stock price, Mm. right? And- you, it felt like you didn't have ownership yet. And um, it's kind of hard to do an employee stock option plan if you haven't issued shares to the uh, other shareholders. So you, nobody knows what they have. And when nobody knows what they have, all kinds of weird things can happen and surprises, right? So what's happened now is the folks at Y Combinator created a worse document for investors called a SAFE which I think is paradoxical. I think they named it specifically because it's not safe for 
investors, but safe for founders. And the Securities and Exchange Commission actually issued a warning about safes, calling yeah. them unsafe. Right. So. And so now Y Combinator is going to have to take the blowback, I think. But in this story, Top Tail is a convertible. But they're both imperfect documents because they're both learned documents. And they're both designed to be $5,000 or less to execute as opposed to a round of funding, which right. is 30000 40000 50000 if you're using like one of the top firms. Yes. And that money comes out of the founder's share. So you, if you, my, back in the day, you'd raise $3 million. And in your term sheet from whichever top firm, the founder would pay that legal expense, not the fund, the firm. So you'd be paying your 30K to do it and the 30K for the venture firm. You could negotiate that term. So put it all together. Um, what it, the, the thing that it helped was quick financing and lower costs. And now the chickens have come home to roost in this case. If you put an expiration date on it, which is what we do, within 24 months, we convert to equity in preferred shares. There is no choice. Um, what was nice about convertible notes is they had a term, two years. If they expired, you could do an extension. And that created a nice check-in point because when I was doing my early angel investing, I had that as leverage with founders to say, oh, what's going on with the company? So if they went dark... They would email me and be like, oh, hey, I need to extend this note and I should catch up with you about the business. And it's like, yeah, I emailed you three times. Like, you haven't heard from you in a year. What's going on? So that was one of the nice aspects that was taken out between a convertible and the safe journey, right? Convertibles had a term, safes didn't. Right. And so we just put the term back in because you can do whatever you want with a side letter. A side letter is a document that's just between one investor and the company that states ad additional rights like information or whatever. So I think that the solution to this is really going back to the Series C documents where I think if anybody raises over 2 or $3 million, there's a lot at stake mm -hmm. for everybody, mm -hmm. the founder. There should be clarity. Mm -hmm. And the thing that's been really bad is, um, and I don't think this has gotten public yet, but the Y Combinator anti-investor um, gestalt, their, their, their culture is anti-investor, I think because Paul Graham was screwed by investors is what I understand. Um, and they don't really, and they, they look at investors as like a necessary evil to be manipulated or screwed. But it's supply and demand, isn't it? I mean, you have yeah. more and more and more money wants to get into venture. Correct. And that's why they're able Just to accelerate it. Yeah, yeah. And they're, that's why they're able to pull shenanigans like this. And Demo Day, in fact, is an artificial construct to make FOMO uh, amongst a group of unsophisticated investors. The sophisticated investors don't go anymore. Or if they do, they just go to network. The unsophisticated investors go there and they actually believe founders who've been trained by Y Combinator partners to say, you have to close quick, you have to close quick. And don't worry about the valuation, don't worry about the documents, you're gonna miss out. The train's leaving the station. Every time I talk to a founder there and they tell me that, I say, okay, I can meet with you like three weeks from now, my schedule's busy. Um, talk to my assistant, we'll put it on the schedule. And uh, in all cases, the, the round is not closed. Mm. So they actually created this FOMO uh, in order to get people to make irrational decisions. That's why I, I don't have a lot of respect for that part of YC. I do respect YC, obviously, as an institution. Hey, everybody. I'm here with my friend Jason Maynard, who works at NetSuite. Tell everybody, what do you do, Jason? You know, I do, I do many things here at NetSuite, but I run the field operations for the business unit. After you've implemented it, what should I be looking for as a founder when I'm looking at my numbers? So once I've got my numbers clean, what should I be focused on? Is it cash flow, projections? How does a, a founder go from you know, that product market fit phase, which is usually the first year or two, to that scale phase. So the biggest thing in every company is what are your customer acquisition costs? When you're really trying to figure out, once you go from product market fit, it's how do you efficiently acquire customers, right? I mean, that's the thing that everybody has to worry about. How do you- CAC. CAC. Yeah. How do you generate top line? So those to me are the metrics. If you look at successful scaling companies, so they figure out the unit economics of how to acquire and retain a customer. If you don't get that right, nothing else works. Yeah, you're, if you don't have your unit economics right, you're going to be hitting the gas on a car where maybe the steering wheel is not attached, yeah. and that's not going to be pleasant for anybody yeah. on the, in the car. Brakes don't work, you yeah. name it. Yeah, no, but yeah. that's the, look, it's, it's basic business 101, but that is the thing that if you think about companies that have figured the model out early on, you know, you got to get that right. If you don't, doesn't mean you can't go raise more money, mm. but it either down the road at some point that has to become the the key thing all right right now netsuite is offering you valuable insights with a free guide 
the seven key strategies to grow your profits. So go to netsuite.com slash twist, netsuite.com slash twist, and get that free guide, seven key strategies to grow your profits. We appreciate the work you're doing in the startup community. It's great Thanks, stuff. Thanks, pal. Thanks. All right, we'll be back with more. I, I remember... Uh... I mean, this was like six years ago, I think 2013, I, I went to a demo day and there were people complaining, investors complaining about uncapped mm -hmm. notes. That was two years ago. Oh, two years ago. Okay. Yeah. Well, so Three years ago, yeah. Is it still a thing where- I don't think people just, have the audacity to do it. I laugh at not people anymore. when they say it. Okay. I literally laugh. But people have, people have given money to startups without any of the potential benefit of an angel Well, investor, you do get a discount. Right? Okay. So what they would say is uncapped- or, uh, I'm sorry, it's uncapped with a 20% discount to the next round. I see. So, okay. so let's say I put in 100K, you put in 100K. I get $1.20 worth of shares, you right. get a dollar worth at the conversion, which may probably may is a reflect, bad idea. It may or may not reflect the risk yeah. that you're taking as an early investor. Yeah, right? uh, and what could happen in that case is if the company was sold, you would just get the 20% dis difference, right? So let's say you had put 100,000 in and it sold for 20 million or something like that. and you get a 20% discount to that. It's just a tiny amount of money for the risk you're taking. And yeah. that was like almost peak. That was amongst the things Y Combinator did that really alienated the venture community. Like the venture community doesn't go there anymore and they're outwardly contemptuous of the demo day practice. Like you see people publicly admonishing it, like criticizing. It. And then the stupid thing that YC does is they're so sensitive and like circle the wagons that they ban people from going. Mm. So they ban me, they but ban they, Sequoia Partners, they ban Jamath. But it's still, a it's still a very successful machine. Of course it is, yeah, it's sort they, of like Their Harvard. deal flow is fantastic. And they, um, they, they, get these, they get these companies that are already going to be pretty darn good. At a discount. Uh, at a discount, yeah. yeah. And, so, and here's the other thing that's, listen, it's worth it because it does put them on the radar. But here's the other thing. Um, the top companies no longer go to demo day. They get funded in the first couple of weeks by the partners there mm. and by the insiders. And they'll mm. deny this, but I mean, you can just do a little research and you'll find out. These five companies went to YC but didn't go to demo day. That would be the equivalent of you and I playing poker at the table mm. and then Paul Graham and you know, Michael Sebo. That's Cibol. really interesting. I didn't realize that. Yeah, Michael Sebo and Paul Graham are like, oh yeah, we took the aces out of the deck. We've got them right here. Right. Uh, let's deal the cards. And you're like, Wait a second. You guys get two aces. So imagine if you invested in Y Combinator companies. If you're the sucker going to demo day, mm -hmm. you're probably investing in the anti-portfolio. They've probably taken out the GitHub and the Airbnb and the Reddit, whatever the successful companies are I see. of that cohort before you even get in there. So you're investing in the rest. I see. And the whole notion of Y Combinator is they're buying so low and selling so high that they can make a ton of mistakes. So why not do 400 or 500 companies a year? But put, putting putting YC aside for one second, yeah. wh where are we uh, in startup financing in terms of the, the this constant kind of uh, struggle for leverage between the founder and the investor? Where are we in 2019? Yeah, I think all the VCs have moved downstream and they're saying, come to me when you have 3 million in revenue. And they've said, you know what? This is a, a we call it internally the MVP um, music festival, like the MVP party. There's just a bunch of kids launching a bunch of MVPs. The products never make it to critical mass. They never get customers. They never get to $10,000 a month in revenue and they go away. So what VCs have said is there's too many companies. Screw it. We'll just live downstream. Come to us when there's 3 million in revenue and we'll put 10 million in for 20%. VCs used to pick apples in the orchard. Now they're like, the orchard? Yeah, you take care of that. Y Combinator, Jason, Cowboy, Aileen, you know, Lee. They, they just pair VC. They've just abdicated the entire uh, tending of the orchard where the apples come from, and they just want to buy the, them at the market. But the valuations are still incredibly high. Yeah, but think right. about it this way. if As one VC told me, Jason, just bring it to me when it's a done deal, and I'll overpay and mark up your investment. I just don't want to invest in that many companies. I want to do one or two investments a year of 10 or $20 million. So as the fund size went up, when you have a billion dollar fund and you're investing in 30 names, that's 30 million per name. Mm. And you have six partners. So they're doing five investments each over four years. So they're doing 1.x investments per year. They so an Andreessen and Horowitz partner is putting one $20 million bet a year yeah. for every 10 months. And that's why when you look at their Instagrams, they're at Coachella, Burning Man, Italy, Kyoto, that's why they're taking four months of vacation because they make one giant bet a year. They're not making like Sequoia and Benchmark used to 10 $3 million bets or Fred Wilson would 
you know, a bunch of two, three, four million dollar bets for 30% or 20%. They're making the $20 million bet for 10 or 20%. It's a whole different ballgame since the fund sizes got too big. Mm. So they, to answer your question is, they've moved out. They just left it here. And so for firms like ours, we did 80 investments and we'll do 80 investments in 2019. We're able to get between six and 15% ownership in these companies before most VCs even get interested. They want to see 3 million in revenue. They want to eliminate all product market fit risk. So they don't go to demo day. Or if they do, they're just going there to say hi to people. They're not mm -hmm. going to invest in any of those companies. So that's why you see four or five rounds of funding. And this is really the deadly thing that YC companies, peak YC was the handshake protocol. Like, do you, do you know about that? The handshake protocol. So the handshake protocol is they made a little app where you say, I want to invest. And then oh, like you're locked in. Right. And so when I first got that app, when I used to be invited to demo day, I pressed like a couple of buttons. And when I pressed the buttons, like one of the founders just sent me a term sheet with a DocuSign for 100000 And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. I, I did the handshake. Like, I want to meet you. Not that I want to invest. So like, oh, well, we know that we read on your blog that you do 100K typically. So we thought we just send it because we're closing. And, you know, if you want in, you got to get in. Right. And I was like, no. <laughs> but then the other thing they were doing is if you sign this week, it's an $8 million cap. Next week's nine. The week after is 10. So like all these games. It's really like manipulative games that like Jedi mind tricks don't work on certain people. You know, like using Jedi mind tricks like that, trying to fool like Sequoia or Benchmark or yeah. Lightspeed, it's just not going to work. So all those games wind up making Y Combinator look silly and like untrustworthy. And I think that's like a little bit of a vibe like that in the valley of like, eh, just let's see what comes out of it. Like whatever the 2019 class is, talk to me in 2021. And we're just going to skip it. And there's enough angel investors and seed funds out there to put the three million in. But you think generally the the, the veteran firms, the, the benchmarks, Sequoias, et cetera, the top, kind of top tier firms, they they're not going to they they have taken back some leverage over time because things got a little crazy in one direction or another. Yeah, I think the founders running amok and no governance is cool. That was the other thing. It was like no governance is cool. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing a convertible note, there's no board, there's no lead investor. And then, right. you know, right. uh, we invested in a company, uh, Circa, that was doing news. I'm sure you remember. Yeah, yeah, sure. And the one thing the founder told me when they went under was, I wish we had a board and somebody had put more than 50K in because he'd raised $3 million in these party rounds. Yeah. Nobody cared when they were dying and there was no advice for him. It was like a very lonely thing. Yeah. So with all our companies, we try to encourage them to have board meetings, even if it's just like a one hour, one, four times a year, yeah. to start being adults. Start treating this seriously. Not like a giant music festival like Coachella. This isn't Burning Man. This is business, mm -hmm. right? Like Burning Man's Burning Man. Coachella's Coachella. And like business is business. Have a board. Have governance. Have board members. Have a lead investor. Do information rights. Like just take it more seriously. And then some people were doing really unethical things like you're some dipshit Dentist, I'm going to give you a $15 million cap. Oh, you're sophisticated Ron Conway or mm. Jason Calacanis mm. or Cyan Bannister. We'll give you a $9 million cap. Mm. But you don't know that people are investing on different terms. Right. And you don't read the documents. Right. That's why we put MFN, most favored nation, into all our documents. If you get, and we have information rights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then we see the cap table. So if you gave a mere 2x the number of shares as launch, yeah. we would just say to you, oh, we have MFN. So either you have to take those shares away from him or you have to give us the same deal as him because that's the best deal. So we'll take the best deal, right? So there's all these games. But, but aren't there still so many unsophisticated investors that like, okay, you, you clearly have your shit together, right? I do you, now, you, the second you, half of investing. Yeah, okay. First four years, so, I wasn't paying attention. So you you know what you're doing. You know how to uh, insulate yourself from from potential problems and make sure that the deal is fair and make sure everyone's on the same page. Yeah. Um, there's still a lot of unsophisticated investors. There's Correct. still a lot of uh, money coming in from various places. Yeah. So why wouldn't a founder say, ah, you know what? I'll just take it from somebody who's who's not you, who's it's fine. Yeah, pay I less mean, attention. Well, because they add, bring nothing to the table. Um, like if you get myself or you know Pejman or Mar from Pear or um, you know Freestyle or Cowboy or Homebrew, you get someone like that on your cap table, you're going to be it opens doors. You're going to walk into Sequoia and Benchmark and whatever, and it's going to be like, oh, oh, Satya from Homebrew did this. Oh, Aileen okay. did this. Oh, Mar from Perry did this. Okay, now you're on second base. You, you're going to you're going to get the meeting. Whereas if you've got a bunch of like dentists and nobodies on the cap table who have no experience in startup land, they're not going to be able to open those doors. So that's the reason and people want sophisticated investors. If you have a bunch of idiotic investors, well, what are they going to do for you? Not much. They're just going to confuse you, and you're going to. You know, 
So professionalism, I think, is probably what they're buying into. Fair enough. Just to go back uh, a second to to your your complaints about uh, about Bloomberg, and I don't know if you want to talk about the the state of journalism in the Valley Let's right now. It, yeah. But and I I don't know if we've talked about this before, but companies when they have good news, hmm. they know how to tell that good news. Yep. Um, so even Bloomberg, as an example, you know, uh, or us, a company will go to us and say, we have good news. Yeah. We're growing at X rate. Here's our revenue. Here's yeah. what's going on. We got a new investment. Tell our story. Yeah. Um, we all do that. Um, but that's, you know, you're saying you're, you're hearing from somebody who maybe doesn't, is not approached in that way. So, um, what are they going to do? Well, they're going to look for the stories that maybe companies don't want to be written because there's plenty. Yeah. There's an infinity yeah, of those be, stories. It should be fair and balanced. I think you know everything's a pendulum. And when I was in journalism, like we were taught to be objective, and if we we're going to mention somebody in a story, to call them. Sure. Um, and like I can tell you, I get quoted in stories that the journalist never even calls me and says like we're quoting you. They're like just rip something off my Twitter or take something from a quote I said well, ten years ago. Twitter is public. It's public, but, no doubt. You know. But we're you know. I'm just in a story without ever being called or emailed. It's just very weird. It's yeah. like against the basics of what we were taught. Like if you're going to source somebody, you would ask them like, hey, I saw your tweet. Like, would you like to discuss this or expand upon sure, it sure. or something? But, but the, the reason why I bring it up is that, um, you know, business models are important and they dictate what you can and cannot do in journalism. So yes. if you have a good business model, subscription, you can then have the time necessary to do what you need to do. Right. Bloomberg is also a very good business model with financial data supporting the journalism yeah. there. And I would say, generally speaking, they are on the side of good. So you may have an issue with one person there, yeah. but I think overall, that kind of institution, no, they came to they're, me, they're better set up. They're better set up. They, were, they came to me with like, oh, one of your companies is paying for vacation. How does this make you feel as an investor? And I'm like, um, this company tripled revenue in the last two years. And the founders worked tirelessly for six years. Mm. It's massively profitable. Uh, I think I trust his judgment. He CC'd above if you'd like to talk to him. And I just CC'd her. And I was sure. like, and by the way, you work at Bloomberg. like, Yeah. But but uh, but I'm wondering. She probably approached you because she, somebody was you know, felt that that was wrong or something or right. Uh, yeah, I'm listen. I it's just I think when you so we, so look we at, pursue leads. I mean, we'll pursue leads. We'll ask all the questions. The and, thing I'm really like objecting to since and maybe I'm just like get off my lawn like old journalist kind of guy now at 48. But like we used to really research stories like you do at the information. Like the information comes across as like this crazy outlier now because you guys call people and do like really thorough a really thorough job. That used to be this table stakes. And now everything is just like, I'm going to crank out two or three stories a day mm. with salacious headlines. And the third or fourth paragraph in the story contradicts the headline. And you're mm. like, what's going on here? Like, it's just all link bait. And it's just- Yeah, sure. I mean, there are there are still page view quotas yeah. uh, all around the industry. Sorry, I just had to- I just had to- no, that's uh, sort of my feeling. Defend, you know- yeah, the, I like the, the Bloomberg good, generally. Yeah. I just, I, 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 I just like the fact that the model is working for you guys. It seems yeah. to be. You have 30, 40 yeah. journalists now? Uh, I think close to, th close to 30. Yeah, we're like 30. 40, we're like 40 something employees overall. Yeah. Um, 30, but, uh, like full, any 25 full-time journalists yeah. getting paid, like what you guys are getting paid is serious money. Like it's a legitimate operation. And my mm -hmm. understanding is it's, you know, break even or profitable if it wants to be. It's pretty unique yeah. in the world. No, it's good. It's really good. Yeah. And we got, we got four people in Hong Kong, got people in New York. Seattle, Los Angeles. Yeah, it's working out. Business right. model matters. Well, listen, I appreciate you doing this story. I think, you know, the big takeaway for me is for anybody who's an angel investor or an employee, ask questions. You know, you were asking before, like, employees aren't sophisticated. Um, the great companies make their employees sophisticated. The great venture firms, like when I was at Sequoia, they educated us mm -hmm. as to the value of stock options. They insisted that we educate our employees. They taught us how to educate our employees about when they should exercise or what the exercise window was. And if you left a company before you were fully vested and you had an exercise window, and we had these like really long discussions. You know, the other one is the exercise window. I don't know if you understand that concept. When you leave a company, you have 30 days or yeah. 60 days. Yeah. Yep. yep. And if you have if you're an early employee, even if you're doing like a penny a share, if you've got 10 million shares, this could be serious money tens of thousands of dollars. And a lot of times employees, this is the dark secret, employees leave the company. They don't have the money to pay for private company right. stock. Right. 
and their shares just go back into the employee stock yes. option pool. So yes. probably a full one third or half of employee stock options never get claimed. Yeah, it's like a golden handcuff, right? Keeps you there. Keeps you there. Yeah. And but the exercise window, I think, you know, we had these long conversations uh, when I was a Sequoia founder and other folks about how long that window should be. And I think all the sophisticated firms want to build that trust with employees because you want to compete against Facebook or Google or Microsoft in the day or Amazon for those employees. So you want them to really understand that these things could be worth something and what their strike price is and what their exercise window is. And now there's a movement to make the exercise window 10 years. So right. if you leave Uber, right. this was a big thing with Uber This was as well. a big thing at Uber, It was yeah. the exercise window. Yeah. People wouldn't leave because they didn't right. want to have to pay because the price that it, it's a high class problem. Like this is only a problem a, if the company has appreciated in value significantly, which has only happened, you know, one out of a thousand companies, Facebook, Google, Uber, Airbnb. Did you tell Travis that that was wrong or you felt that was wrong? Um... I don't know if I specifically had that discussion with him, but yeah, you know, we, we Travis and I always have long discussions about right and wrong and debates of stuff. Like we, I can remember. He's it. an interesting guy for sure. The best founders I've ever invested in are um, have a very specific uh, uh, worldview that makes them successful, and they are not going to back down from that worldview without a fight or like a real debate. And the real debate I had was tipping. I can only remember having yeah. two really deep debates. Tipping, because I like to tip. I'm from Brooklyn, and I want a tipping in the at Uber app. But he, he makes a good point. It's it's yeah, unfortunate it's that people are not paid well enough that you have to tip them. Exactly. It should be the opposite. He's, Correct. He's not wrong. We discussed, and I think if he was still there, he probably would have executed this way. The six star is how he would describe it to me. Okay. And so we brainstormed this of, what if there was a hidden way to give a tip in Uber that was an Easter egg? Yeah. And so the suggestion I gave him was, what if you held the fifth star for more than three seconds and it popped up, would you like to give a six star and a tip of this amount? Mm. That would have been like the killer, awesome unlock. The other thing was surge pricing, which I was wrong about and he was right about. Surge pricing, anytime you've been stuck and couldn't get a car, Surge pricing is pretty rad. Like mm -hmm. being able to get a car in an emergency situation or, you know, on a holiday or something on Thanksgiving or Christmas or New Year's, like, yeah, better to pay 3X than not get it, I think. And you do that when you're buying tickets to the south of France, you know, Amir, you know, when you take your six oh, sure. weeks off and yeah, you go to the south of totally. France during the high season, <laughs> you know, that business class is triple. And yeah. we just deal with these things, Amir. Like, put it on What's the business class. It's the no part. concept. It's literally. It, <laughs> Naval had a good experience for it. It was like he, ha, you know, he's got this little micro. I don't know if you're listening to Naval's like micro podcast, Naval Ravikant from I, Angel. I know Naval Ravikant, yeah, but I did he, not know he does follow, micro podcast. I, Naval, he does these like he's got a micro podcast. It's a really clever idea. He just explains one topic for three minutes or two minutes or five minutes, so you can just you know listen to them while you're in line at the you know Starbucks or whatever. Um, Isn't that what Twitter is for? Sort of, and he puts them on Twitter, yeah, but yeah. it's really good because he explains like one concept and he just talked about how there are some people who will pay a ridiculous amount more for something that is marginally better. And the example he used was like a business class or first class ticket is 50% more space than a coach ticket, but they cost five times as much. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you're getting 50% more value, but it costs five times as much. And the only reason to do that would be status your ego, or you don't care about money and you have so much of it that you'll overpay. And in that case, it subsidizes the rest of the plane. It's a really interesting kind of yeah. way of looking at it. I this? I All right, listen, continued success, Amir. Thank you for breaking the news on this. Um, I, it's my sincere hope that this guy, uh, Tazo Duval, gets sued into oblivion. You can talk to him too. I'm sure he'll talk to you. I don't think he's going to talk to me because I am wailing on him. He's definitely not going to talk to me. And I think this guy's you, a coward. You might be surprised. I think he's a coward if, for doing this. Um, I think the right thing to do here, to Sao Duval, if you're listening, just convert to equity, get, be a mensch, do what you're supposed to, not even be a mensch, just be a basic human being. Give your employees basic stop options. And if you're thinking of going to work for this company or you're thinking about using them, to build your app, you've got to get your head examined. Anybody who would screw their co-founder, their employees, and their investors, the people who supported them to get where they are, anybody who would do that is going to screw you eventually. That's for future employees, future investors, and future users of TopTel. Do not use TopTel service until they clear this up. He should just... It's such its such bad reputation. What Did you talk to him? Yeah, I did actually talk he, to him. He called you. Uh, How long did it take you to get him on the phone? I'm curious. 
Well, I actually talked to him before I knew what the story was going to be. Oh, okay. Uh, and then came back to him later. It was an email conversation. Yeah. He's not pleased? Um, I, I don't. I don't think he's pleased. Um, I um, yeah, it's interesting. the The original What's your interview. What's take on him? Yeah. Uh, it's hard to say. The original interview was recorded by him, which I agreed to only on the condition that he also give me the recording, which I still do not have. Um, huh. But uh, you should have recorded it yourself. Yeah, yeah. Um, you just didn't happen to have your phone set up he, for that because it's illegal in San Fran- uh, in California to record that, right? On a phone, two party. Yeah, yeah. You have, to, you have to get it. You New York, you don't. So New York journalists. But he, can no, he asked, he asked. He asked. Yeah. And I said, I said, sure. Just give me, give me a copy. Um, he has a very interest. We didn't talk about how colorful, colorful he is, and maybe we'll leave that for the story. But he has a very interesting idea of what intellectual property is, huh. and that includes. Uh, personnel changes at his company. So for instance, if his co-founder leaves the company but hasn't announced it publicly, uh, he he takes that, uh, he, he believes that that is not necessarily something that somebody else like me should be talking about, which is oh, very so he interesting. wants to sue you no, 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 no. for Nobody stealing their IP? No, 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 no. It's just, it's, it's it sounds interesting. like a failed threat. He, he's, you know, this is his baby, right? And he treats it as such. And so it's very, you know, everything about it is very sensitive. And I think, um, uh, but but again, he's in, he's large and in charge. So there's no is this person there's, there's no there's no pressure well? on him. There's no pressure yeah. on him to do anything different because he has created a very successful entity. That's my point. I think he's going to get sued into oblivion, I, and I think that no. when they do discovery, he's going to realize like screwing people over. It only takes like one or two people you screw over to really dig in. Like if I was one of these employees, I would create a revenge startup, and I would just go right after him, take all the employees because that's fair game. And, you know, just gut the place and give them equity. That's how I got we, Peter we, Rojas, by the way. Do you know that story? No, I don't know that story. So Nick Denton promised um, Peter Rojas mm. equity okay. in um, Gizmodo. Okay, okay. I pursued him in Elizabeth Spires or Spears? Spires? I think Spires That's how you pronounce it. Anyway, Elizabeth wanted to go work for New York Magazine. Peter, I told him, I'll double whatever... Nick Denton's paying you, and I'll give you equity, and uh, you'll be worth millions of dollars. 18 months later, he was worth millions of dollars. We sold mm. the company to AOL. Right on. But it was like, that was literally my recruit to him was, Denton will never give you equity. He's yeah. avoided this conversation five times. He promised he never did it. He's never going to do it. Yeah. And then after that, Denton started giving equity to employees and papering it. Mm. I don't think it was became worth anything after the lawsuit, but- um, So your point is, integrity matters. I think, yeah, if you're going to do a deal like this and you want to use equity as an incentive, you kind of got to live up to that. And I think Tasso knows that he screwed everybody. He knows he screwed everybody. He says it's all legal. Read your read your documents, read your contracts. Yeah, that's the lowest form of ethics is when people say it's not illegal. Mm-hmm. Like it might not be illegal sure. to stalk somebody to a certain point or harass somebody. That doesn't mean it's ethical or moral. Like there's there's a large number of people who have done completely unethical, immoral things who did not go to jail for them. Like it's a long list, and I I cannot. I am just in shock of the thing that makes no sense here is he could give ten percent to the employees, seventeen percent to his co-founder, and fifteen percent to the investors. Right. That's forty percent or so. He would still own fifty eight percent of the company. Those people would be on his side, rooting for him, motivated, and the company would become worth more than 40%. And in fact, the company did become what it's worth because those people believed in him and trusted him and gave him that money and gave them their time in exchange for equity. And he abused it. And now I'm getting pissed off again. I'll, I'll let you have the last word. <laughs> God damn it, I'm pissed off again. I am sorry. I I just... Uh... It's a good story. Read the story, everyone. <laughs> Uh, everybody read the story. Everybody subscribe to the information and follow Amir, A-M-I-R. All right. One of the sacred covenants of startup land is that employees who join a startup company take a lot of risks. They could go work for a big company. They could probably get better benefits. They could probably get a better salary. And they could probably have to work less and have bigger teams, right? So if you join Google this year in 2019 or 2020, you would start with uh, you know, tens of thousands of co-employees. You wouldn't have to take a lot of risk. You could rest, invest. You can 
you know, leave early and there's no real struggle or there's no big question mark. You might get some RSUs, restricted stock units thrown at you as a little pot sweetener, but you're not going to get the life changing wealth uh, in all likelihood, unless you're a top 20 employee, let's say, that you would get if you joined Google in the first year or two. This is obvious to everybody. This is the lottery ticket system, which Silicon Valley relies on in order for talented people to join unknown companies. The quid pro quo is you take risk, we give you equity. The equity has a one in 10 chance, generally speaking, one in five chance of becoming worth something. 80% of the time, it's worth zero. 10% of the time, it's worth a nice vacation. And then the other 10%, maybe you buy a condo, a house, or two. And then in 1%, the Uber, the Facebook, the Google examples, it could be life-changing. So what happens to an employee or a team of employees when that covenant is broken? Well, that's what happened at TopTal. TopTal, as you know, um, broke not only the covenant with investors, investors who had given them money explicitly to get a return, they didn't convert that uh, convertible note, that safe rather, that simple agreement for future equity. They didn't convert that. They didn't give their investors the uh, expectation they had, and that is the expectation culturally here in Silicon Valley. They screwed them, in other words. Now, that's one level of screwing people. That's one level, in my opinion, of lack of ethics. But to screw the rank and file, the employees, the people who are lifting you up as the founder of a company, if what is alleged is true, and it seems to be undeniable, the founder of TopTal is the worst human being to ever run a startup in Silicon Valley or otherwise. Or he's definitely up there, top 10. So uh, on the program next is Scott Ritter. Scott, you were uh, an employee from 2011 to 2018. You took seven years of your life and dedicated it to this company, and you saw it grow phenomenally. You were the director of client success, a critically important position. That is the position for people who don't know where you make sure that the customers who gave you money have a great experience so they come back. And you were one of the first sales hires. You heard my preamble. Is the covenant being broken, the lottery ticket being taken away from you, the winning lottery ticket has been taken away from you, Scott. How does it make you feel to win the lottery and then have the person behind the counter take it from you? Well, you know, Jason, after the amount of time that a person spends in a company like that, it's, it, it's, a, it's a work family, you know? So it's even more heartbreaking when you get to that, you know, when something like that happens and it's, it's more personal even than what would be normally. Now, when you say breaking the covenant, I think there might be two distinctions, you know, like legally and ethically or however you want to state that. I think in you know, most cases, he's pretty covered on the, on the legal side. You know, he's going to pull up, you know, in his interview, even recently mentioned that, um, you know, he never promised anybody equity, you know, he always, you know, in, in the way that they had those drawn up, you know, unless we, you know, unless they were to get another round of funding or sell the company, et cetera, then, you know, I mean, that was basically what needed to happen to trigger those, but you know, that, that was, uh, you know, an expectation, a, a more than average expectation, actually. You were talking uh, when you first started about the percentages, you know, well, you know, maybe not quite Google level, but definitely in or past the condo stage you were talking about is where we were expecting to be. And um, yeah, it's it's heartbreaking, man. I mean, they answered the question in, in a couple of words, really. Yeah, and what was the CEO like to work with at the beginning? Tell me about when you first met him. You know, Tasso is, um, he's, he's a different individual. I'll, I'll tell you one thing. He's absolutely genius when it comes to something that he's focused on, like TopTal. I mean, he could, he, you know, I don't know if you've had time to look up any of his MSNBC interviews or some of the other things that are online where he's talking about the company. He's very passionate about TopTal. I'll give him that. Um, I think that he's a little rough around the edges when it comes to being tactful with people that, he, that he's working with and things. Now, if you were to ask him, he would say that he's just very direct and honest. But I think, I think that in, in, when you're in the, the type of position where you are dealing with employees that direct and honest or brutally direct and honest may not always be the best policy. And I know that he's, you know, he can, he can ruffle some feathers. Um, 
I, I will, I do have a one really good story about Tasso though. <laughs> when I went through my divorce many, many years ago uh, now, I've been there maybe a year or so. He did, you know, I was pretty depressed. He had called me up and was absolutely amazing. You know, he, he had parents that had passed away and he, he just said, you know, we're here for you. Anything that you need, you know, he just, uh, you know, he, that was cool. But um, I've seen the other side of the coin as well. So did he obviously got you pumped up to join the company to put in large amounts of hours. You're saying he's super charismatic. That is his superpower in a way. Um, mm-hmm. And like maybe some other leaders who are driven, he's candid, candid mm-hmm. to the point of sometimes it being uncomfortable. But he also showed this incredibly caring side to just take time out of his day to talk to you about your personal struggles. Did he sure. pump people up to come work for him with the company's increase in valuation and the yeah. promise of stock options? T- take me to those moments. You know, there, and there's the word promise. You know, I, I had, the only example I can give as far as actually promise of equity was my situation. And it wasn't the whole being vested after five years scenario. It was way before that, actually, when they had to make an adjustment to the commission structure. I was the second sales guy in the company. Brendan, the COO, the other co-founder, was the first. And we got busy to the point that he got uh, called me up and said, dude, can you you know, answer the phone? I'm, I'm getting slammed here. And I, start, I started, uh, they, they redirected the 800 number. I started picking up calls. Well, as I'm talking to, to clients, I'm, I'm picking up clients. Uh, I would have told you before that, I, you know, I don't want to do sales. I don't like salespeople. Don't like being, uh, mostly it's the feeling of being sold something Mm. that's like that if even if i need it i deliberately then won't do it if i think they're pushing me too hard so yeah that's how kind of how i handled the position really just i knew what what our value proposition was which is awesome and i knew what the type of client would be that would be a good fit for us and if that was a match then you know i I definitely tried my best to convey that over and i had the largest book of business even when i left actually there but um were you paid well or you paid okay or you paid great I would say, um, well, there's, they were getting back to that. So the equity, when we had to make that change, I was at 2,800 a week commissions. My base pay was 3,000. It stayed 3,000 almost up until the end. That never changed much. 3,000 a month? Yeah, on the base, right? So you had 3,000 a uh, month, and then you got 10,000 coming in commissions. Yeah, yeah. So you made about had, 150 a year. Yeah, yeah. And they made the change, and I went from, well, he called me up and he said, Scott, he goes, this isn't scalable. And, and I agree with him. I was getting every single, you know, whether the client, if they had one or 10 developers, I made, I was making the same thing on all of them. Yeah. And I know that's, and I knew that wasn't scalable, but it was drastic. Uh, he said, listen, we're going to give you 5,000 in cash tomorrow, you know, like mm. right or no, today. And, uh, and then he said, and $10,000 in company equity. So I can't speak for anybody else. Yeah. I know that he actually told me that. And in his last interview, he says he records all of those. So I encourage him to pull that up. But, he records uh, no. covertly everybody's conversation about compensation. Uh, he, he, he told uh, Andrew at Mixergy that he he records any financial calls and stuff just to make sure that he's, you know, that he can go back and pull that up if he has to. And so I don't know. That was a long time ago. Maybe he maybe he did or not. Mm. I hope he did because if he you know yeah. he says he never promised anybody directly, I, that would be one at least that's the only one I can speak to for sure. But um, hmm. yeah, so I was I went anyway from twenty eight hundred to six hundred like wow. overnight. Yeah. So it took me the next five plus years to build it back up to pretty close to exactly where it was even, you know, prior. And, um, yeah. And so that was my, you know, and there were a few times that, you know, my, my, uh, director of sales who, by the way, Mark Bosma loves you, watches your show all the time. Thanks. Yeah. He's awesome. He said, um, he actually he said, dude, I went to Brendan and asked for a raise for you. (laughs) Yeah. I didn't, I didn't even know. And he goes, uh, they said no because uh, you're vested now. I'm like, oh. So cool. hold on, let me just recap for the audience because yeah, yeah. sometimes maybe they don't know all Silicon Valley speak. You could offer ten thousand dollars in equity to take a serious haircut on your commissions of you know eighty percent of your commissions, ninety percent of your commissions go right. away overnight. They give you five k, which you were making in a week and a half, to buy you off. Promises you ten k in equity, and it never shows up. Um, no. And then tells other people. To confirm, you don't need a raise because you got equity. Yeah, right. Well, it came from Brendan 
Yeah, so second hand, you got that, but there's no reason for Brandon to, yeah, he's a COO co-founder. Yeah. And the original question was, did he, was that used to, um, and to entice? And I, you know, I would say he would, he would deny that maybe, but Mm. maybe he doesn't realize how powerful he speaks. I mean, he, 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 uh, you know, he he can talk people down on their salaries. He can, you know, he, he knows he's good at that, but, um, I would, I would argue that a lot of people definitely, as you, as you mentioned in the beginning, this made that decision based on thinking that they were going to get a piece of the pie later. You know, I mean, that that was more than just a, you know, a, a roll of the dice type scenario in their heads, in their heads, they actually believed based on their conversation or, you know, whatever it's also that they, that that was a probable reality basically. So let's discuss Tasso and his partner um, who is uh, Brandon, mm-hmm. who you worked with. He was a CEO co-founder. Right. Certainly, Tasso referred to him as his co-founder, correct? And I'm trying to think if he ever actually said that out loud. I mean... And what is, his title was that, co-founder inside the company? People yeah, yeah, referred yeah, to think, him as the co-founder? Yeah, I mean, even on, on the uh, team page, uh, yeah, they, they were listed as co-founders. Yeah, so... So he, in addition to screwing you over twice... His own co-founder listed on the website has zero equity. Yeah, that's a that's a really weird deal. I don't I honestly until this whole thing blew up, I thought I, I figured Tasso had a majority, but I didn't I, I figured that Brendan I, somebody even told me he is at least 25% or something. And um yeah, they come to find out that uh you know Tasso's saying from the start that he was just an employee and was never you know, whatever. I, I don't. Um, so that's just a that. straight. That's just a straight up lie. Yeah, I mean, as far as how everybody in the company thought of it, I mean, whether on paper or that I, don't, I really don't think even on paper, but I don't know. It's that's that's, you know, <laughs> I don't think so. But whatever. That's that's my opinion. Yeah, and he, you know, um, Brendan filed the lawsuit in July um, that he was verbally promised seventy percent of the shares. Do yeah. you think? And, uh, you know, we're going to speculate here. So we're going to put this under speculation, clearly. Sure. The stuff we talked about, you've been very good about what's fact and what's not. So I appreciate that. Yeah. I don't want to lead the witness here. But I do want to talk a little bit about maybe since you did work with Tasso, what you think, your opinion of what his psychology is. Do you think, because I've been trying to figure this out. Do you think that this was a grand strategy from the beginning to screw everybody out of equity? Or do you think over time he realized, well, it's been architected that I have the LLC, I have control, all of these discussions have been verbal, nothing's been put in writing, therefore, worst case scenario, people have to sue me and I settle. Best case scenario, I demoralize everybody and they give up. And if, you know, let's say he would have owned 50 percent of the company, he gets to own 100 because this seems to me such a deliberate breaking of the covenant, right, of the agreement, the sacred agreement here in Silicon Valley, both from rank and file employees like yourself, frontline employees, co-founders and investors, that this seems to me to be a premeditated screwing of everybody up and down the stack. What do you think, having worked with him? for almost right. eight years. Um, I just, I disagree. <laughs> you know, um, I, I think that this was something that, that, that grew. I, I don't think that it was his plan originally. Mm. I don't think when he talked to me and, t- and promised me what he did, you know, back then, well, he didn't even, he didn't say shares. He didn't say, you know, he said 10,000 in equity. I, I, you know, back then I had no idea what that meant. I, in my mind, I'm thinking, well, you know, if, uh, Due to it's the fan, at least I got ten thousand dollars. You know, I, yeah. you know, I didn't really think about the whole increase in valuation or anything like that, or what it would even mean. You know, ten thousand back then is worth what now? Blah blah blah. So twenty um, times, oh, thirty times, forty times. Yeah, yeah, at just, least. No, we're not, oh, we're not going there, man. No, no. no I mean, we, when you joined and you, he made that yeah. offer to you in the first or second year. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And at that time, yeah. how many employees were there? Uh, we had. Six or seven, I think. Yeah. All right. So you were there in the first year. The company was worth in that first year ten million. I was number I was number three or four, yeah. depending on how you look at it. Alvaro and I both started on uh, uh, February or no March first, two thousand eleven. So we were both three and four. Yeah. Scott, at that point. let me explain and, to you what you should have gotten. And I'm not doing this to rub salt in it, but I'm doing it because I think it's important. And you've been kind enough to come on here that 
uh, employees protect themselves. That's the good that can come out of this. But as the third yeah. or fourth employee, um, and given 10,000, 10, 100,000 would be 1% of the company. 10 basis points would be 10,000, right? Mm -hmm. So that would be the valuation at that early stage. Some would argue half of that. The company would have been diluted maybe 20% at this time, right? If they had actually converted that $1.5 million round or converted 15%, right? Diluted 15%. Mm -hmm. In other words, they would have added some there. So what that would equal to you, the company now is doing $200 million, I heard, or something like that. Is that the public whisper number? Yeah. Um, now, keep in mind, that according to Tasso, that's uh, they're trying to compare apples to oranges with with um, WeWork, which used to be Odesk. Or no, no, excuse me. Pardon me. Uh, Odesk, uh, which is uh, Upwork. Thank you. There we go. Yeah, Upwork. And yes. he says, uh, well, they're looking at the gross numbers, which a lot of that does go to the um, to the developer. So right. But they take 30 percent. Is, is that right? Something in that range? It, 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 it varies, but yeah, it's in that range usually. Mm -hmm. Okay, so 30% of 200 million, 60 million, 60 million, um, you know, you would base the company on uh, at least 20 times that. So it'd be 1.2 billion. 1.2 billion, if you owned 1% of that, it'd be 10 million, and 10 basis points would be 1.2 million. You are entitled to 1.2 million in my estimation right now. That's what you should have gotten. And also in the first three or four employees, you would get a premium for being the person who took the most responsibility risk. So at $10,000, it'd be, you know, 10 to 20 basis points would be 1.2 to $2.4 million. Worst case, best case, you probably should have gotten just a straight up point as an early employee like this. One point would have been 10 million. And that's really why I'm really upset about this, Scott, is um, the unnecessary nature of screwing you. It's one thing to screw Andreessen Horowitz, the founder of Quora, um, my friend Roger Dickey from Gigster and other folks who are already affluent and have had their payday. But I'm assuming you haven't had your payday. That's why you're working still. You haven't had your big payday. And you know what? You took a shot with this company. You took that and you hit the 10% chance. And then this, and I'll say it, you don't have to. This, and I'm saying that to Tasso right now. You are for doing this to this employee. This is so horrible that you, I wish nothing but horror for you in your future. I hope you get sued by these investors. I hope you are pariah. I hope every employee leaves your company. And I hope that the employees leave your company, Tasso. I hope your employees leave the company and raise a round of funding and do a revenge startup. And I will be the first to give them a million dollars if they do it. I am infuriated. Now, tell me, Scott, about yes. your company. Now, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm sorry if I was out of line there, Scott. Yeah. Well, you, but you, you have to forgive that. me because yeah, no, I... I hope they start a startup. I went. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I mean, I, I am so on fire about this because as an angel investor myself, if the people who worked at Uber or Calm or Robinhood were screwed the way you were screwed, the entire framework of Silicon Valley falls apart. You have talented right. people who are taking less money to go to these startups. And if somebody like this piece of garbage, Tasso Duval, garbage, were to do this on some regular basis, the entire system collapses. And you know what? Just because you can do something legal, Tasso Duval, just because you can legally be such a horrible human being, how did your parents raise you, Tasso? Seriously, how do you sleep at night? This man should have made his 10 million. He should have made his nut. He did the work for you. Give him his damn money. I'm pissed off. Throw that pin. <laughs> I'm sorry. You know, it's it's uh, funny you, you uh, hit right on it too. During his interview with Andrew, Andrew was really trying to pin him down on what was the what was the one thing that really contributed to the exponential? Because that's really what it was. I mean, we hit a we hit an upturn that was crazy hmm. and uh, it just kept going and going. And he would, you know, he kind of, he was really circling the question and Andrew kept trying to pin him down and pin him down. And, you know, he never really did give anything specific. And so when I wrote a note back to Andrew, Andrew was one of my clients at Top Bell, <laughs> actually Andrew Warner, but um, I, I love Andrew Warner. He's awesome. Yeah. I gave, I wrote him back and I said, dude, 
couple of quick things. I just learned to find, clarifying a few things. And I said, and the one thing I go, the reason I can tell you exactly what it was. I go, it's those core guys, you know, those eight guys, whatever, eight, nine guys that I mentioned in at first, you know, you mm. had Martin, you had Gergai Kalman, you had Alvaro and I, you had uh, Brendan, you know, and dream we, team, we, those first, those dream first team. scripts that we wrote, those first uh, marketing and SEO efforts that Brandon was handling because we didn't have a marketing person. My wife even came on when we had, we got to about 15, 16 people or maybe a little higher. And she became our accounts manager for three and a half years until we got too big where we had to hire licensed CPAs and whatnot. I remember the first time that I actually didn't know everybody in the company for the first time. That's a weird right. feeling, but it, it was the core people. It's those, those four core guys that, you know, that we, um, you know, having a strong foundation like that and of just top notch folks that, you know, uh, they used to joke that my, my, my superpower was charisma you know, whatever, you know, I'm not, you know, my developer days, I tell clients, yeah, you know, C plus was the last language I worked in. Scott, you are uh, charismatic. <laughs> I will tell you that. Yeah, you don't want uh, me touching your code. Yeah. So, no, you know, yeah. here's the thing. This is why I'm so <laughs> angry right now. You bleep that out, but I'm, I don't give a at this point, my podcast. My wife told me to watch my language, dude, and you're the no, one. No, it's saying fine. You know what? They're gonna bleep the <laughs> out of this. Uh, I want every curse word, every <laughs> every bleeped, right. just to make my point, so we can not lose our ratings here. Um, but, but, it just seems to me that none of these great companies, and nobody in life, gets there alone. I'm looking back on my career, so many people at so many times were there for me. And I hope I treated everybody as fairly as possible. I'm not saying I was perfect, but I'm hoping, and I still work on my startups to try to get equity, to try to make sure everybody, and I'm on the board of companies and we approve stock options for these employees on you know, the regular. It's, it's, it's a business karma, maybe. maybe Life that's, karma. Should be life karma. Yeah. I mean, it is. You get what, you know, I'll, I'll tell you something though. I know Tasso pretty well. I think that he actually, in this situation, first of all, he's covered, you know, legally, blah, blah, blah. But in his own mind, I think that he actually thinks that he's accomplished something by, by, by wrangling all of that together under, under, under himself. You know, I think that he, he feels, and maybe there are a group of people out there would say, Ooh, as a business savvy, hardcore person, you know, you, you yeah. know, that's really an accomplishment to actually get the whole no. pie. Yeah, not, no. you know. I'll tell you, but, you know what, Scott? Everybody here in Silicon Valley is appalled. We are appalled. Yeah. I apologize to you on behalf of all investors, of all uh, good people in business. I apologize to you. And I want to try to make it up to you, honestly. And I want my audience to try to make up for Scott losing $10 million because this piece of garbage Tasso I, get to I thought I was at one point too dude I mean I, I don't mind 10 <laughs> I, no we're going to get you goddamn 10 <laughs> and here's how we're going to do it right. I'm going to ask everybody right now to hashtag boycott top tail hashtag boycott top tail and I want you to link to Scott Ritter's company which is called Scrum Spot Scrum Spot, yeah, Scrum you know, Spot. We, Tell we, me uh, everything about your sure. podcast because I am going to tweet about you, your company, and I am <laughs> going to sing from the top of the mountains for TopTel customers to drop TopTel and go to Scrum Spot. Tell me everything. Yeah, Jason, right on. So, um, you know, a big issue that we had, and well, I had a TopTel, and then I, I was at uh, Codemunner X for seven months, were disputes. I mean, it got to the point where. We had had a meeting every Wednesday early, early because everybody had to be on at six thirty my time, and um, it just like like thousands and hundreds, like hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. What would happen though is we engagements would start, and in the model that's used for developer networks now, it's very much that the client manages their own project. Okay, mm, yes, all the responsibility is still on the client. So you go to somebody like TopTal, you're getting that vetted developer and that that wasn't a real aspect it wasn't even three percent 2.987 i think was the last time that i actually did the math i mean it really is out of 100 ruby developers or whatever or php whatever not even three out of those actually make it all the way through the vetting process so it is that part's good but 
the thing is, once we match that developer with the client, we just let them go. You know, you know, we, you know, we try to pre-screen a little bit, make sure, you know, if they've had other projects, but we don't get really into the hmm. gritty of that because yeah. then that would be responsibility. And we don't, you know, unless they're going through the project management vertical or whatever. So disputes, huge ones. I mean, that they would go sometimes six weeks, eight weeks. And then the client would get to us and say, man, things have been going sour for six weeks now, just getting worse and worse. And, you know, by then it's up to twenty, thirty thousand dollars and just crazy. Wow. A lot of cases, it was that the client, even if they've had other projects, really did not know the best methods and tools for managing mm-hmm. remote teams. Agile, agile methods, you know, basically is what it comes down to. Agile, you know, and managing things in the way that developers do when they do their own startups. You know? Right. And um, and the other thing is communication. There's always that gap. You know, clients clients like to see progress, literally. So if that was the case, there wouldn't be any back end, right? It'd be all yeah. front end. And developers argue that, yeah, clients don't understand that they're actually spending time on things, even when they don't see it in the staging server. And um, well, between that and scope creep, you know, mm. it's like, you know, the, the client said, well, tweak this and add this and whatever, probably thinking it was 10 minutes worth of work and it's two hours worth of work, whatever. But so what, what this does, what, what the, uh, the concept is, when I came up with it a couple of years ago, is that ideally the end product, when we get to that stage, will be an automated dashboard where a client can come in, register, pay a, a small deposit, be refundable, kind of like the same model now. It's either refunded or put towards their invoice. And in all of those tools and, and um, uh, processes that we use, such as, uh, you know, we start off, first of all, the clients should have their own Bitbucket or GitHub account, you know, mm-hmm. whatever their repo is, project management tool, Trello, Basecamp, Asana, whatever that is, that's in there, you know, and it's, it's really like, a, it's going to be a, it's going to be a, a site of APIs almost, if you think about it, yeah. you know, calendar will have. So you uh, teach those clients how to manage those developers. Right. Well, and make right sure now I'm doing it manually. Yeah. So basically we, we're calling it, we're coming up with new industry terms that haven't been even invented before. We have uh, what we call a project guide. So we're not a project manager, client's still managing, but we're a guide. So mm, guide on the side, a contract that yeah. kind of lays out the expectations. You need to set up your repo developer side. They need to, you know, get together an estimate, take, uh, put those deliverables into weekly stints, you know, that kind of thing. Everybody's got their own things. And then really from our side, we're kind of checklisting, making sure, because really if you're having a stand up meeting on a Friday or excuse me, on a Monday and a Friday, every week, you know, with your developer, and you guys, you know, you're, you're tracking progress on uh, Trello or Basecamp or whatever you're using. There's never an excuse. Every Friday, you should know exactly where your project is. Yeah. It should never go two weeks. You got to have discipline. Right. You got to have yeah. that discipline and you got to ha- take top ownership developers, of it. The kind of guys that have a passion for code, you know, those top percentage guys and whatever stack it is. Those are the guys that are also, they need structure. Hmm. They're like throwbud racehorses. You don't just get onto one of those and just let it do what it wants. You need to, you know, they like that structure of being put down a, a path of, they're engineers. I mean, that, that just makes sense, right? Monday, at this time we do this. Friday, at this time we do this. Hmm. You know, whatever. You know, we're communicating throughout the week uh, on Slack, you hmm. know, whatever. So those kinds of things, when those are in place, then, well, geez, wow, projects are completed. They don't, they are not getting you know, way behind at any point, really. And, um, you know, there's your disputes, man. All that money, wasted money of, you know, having to refund people or- Yeah, it's brutal. Know. Scott, tell yeah. me your email address so I can give it to sure. everybody in the Scott, audience. Scott, absolutely. Scott at scrumspot.com. Okay, so now if somebody wants to build a website, an app, you're the person to go yeah. to. You will Mobile set it all up web. Mm-hmm. and you're going to be on it. And you're going to be vigilant yeah. and help so that just client. them go- I'm going to be right. So I'm going to be holding the developer accountable and I'll be holding the. And you started this company. Are you working with the team? Yeah. Yeah. I've got a couple of guys. One of them uh, was with us at TopTal, uh, Rish Lodakar. He's, <laughs> he's awesome. So Him this is your company. Wife. You're the CEO founder or. This yeah. Time? I'm the principal principal. I'm calling it principal co-founder at this point. Got until it. I can, yeah. Until I figure things out. Rish, I don't know if he's actually going to join all the way. Great. Uh, but Giorgio's a uh, developer that, he was my best guy over at Code Mentor X. Absolutely. Where are you based? Um, I I am in Oregon right now. Oh, very nice. Time Beautiful. zone, and um, yeah, uh, Georgios is in Greece. 
Harish is all over the world. He's in Texas right now. But all right, uh, listen, I wish you great yeah. success with this company. Yeah. I hope that it scales. I hope that yeah. someday I might be able to be an investor in it. You get a team going and you do it right. You raise money. You uh, put this all together. And uh, just let me ask you a question because I'm an investor in Gigster. I knew this. Uh, I met Roger. I put a small bet in sure. uh, just after the fact because um, he had sponsored some of our events. He was also an investor in TopTal. And he got screwed. And then he did Gigster. Did Gigster came after TopTal? Is that like, yeah. what's your speculation there? I you just know, put that together. Right, yeah. Well, you know, it was interesting because uh, Andrew, did, during his interview with Tasso, he's like, so let me just ask you this, Tasso. Because um, he's, he's like figuring out the model, right? He's like, mm -hmm. so I can, just, uh, I can just basically put an ad out there that I'm doing development. Somebody gets a hold of me. Then I just go grab a developer. And, you know, I'm basically this middleman and, you know, and uh, Tasso wasn't really going to let him, he goes, <laughs> he said, uh, yeah, but you, gotta, you can't let that, you know, the client needs to know that you're using somebody else, not yourself, which is true. Mm. But I, I thought it was kind of um, ironic or, yeah. or uh, hypocritical. But anyway, um, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I was just wondering uh, if, I wonder if, and Gigster was backed by Andreessen Horowitz. Yeah. And Andreessen yeah. Horowitz and Roger were in top and they, now. And they're still, they're still doing they're still doing well. I don't know. Yeah. It's, you know, that magic that we had though, all those, all those people are pretty much gone. When you said, I hope everybody leaves. There's very, there's only like maybe a couple of people still there. How Some does he get employees and how, why would people work with him without this fear of getting screwed? I mean, if well, Tasso the, the Duval. People, the the new people well, coming in the door definitely have the expectation that they're not, they're not ever going to get any part of the company. Right. They, they pay, they pay well. They do they pay do well pay. now. They have to pay yeah. well. So, I mean, that's not the issue. It's yeah. just the whole, you know, getting a piece of the pie issue. So, yeah, I mean. I'm it's... just wondering how anybody could go work for Tasso Duval, knowing that he screwed these early employees and that Tasso Duval screwed his investors and he screwed his co-founder. Why would anybody building a project trust their website to TopTel, trust their business to TopTel, trust TopTel as an employer? Why would anybody well, do business with this individual? It doesn't make any sense to me. That's well, I guess I guess if you really don't have, you know, if you really don't care about, you know, it's like it's like buying. Uh, well, remember back when they had the sweatshops, and you're like, well, mm -hmm. don't buy buy this brand of clothing or whatever. It's something like that kind of. It's not like they don't have great developers. It's not that you know, it's not right. that you're, you know, whatever. If you, especially if you can manage your own project well, mm -hmm. you can get some of the best developers in the world. Got there. it. So the product but is good. That being said, yeah. do you want to support? that or not or whatever and I, don't, yeah. I guess you know i'm gonna go ahead and say don't i hope that you do great i hope that my audience has a great experience working with your fine firm hey, take from a vacation Spot. take a vacation come up here to oregon and i'll take you out we'll go fishing and do some nice. crabbing out yeah you, you do bet, crabbing man. out there oh, dude dungeness man we throw in what throw in the throw in the throw in the crab pots go sand oh, and i love fishing. that and when you're done, you pick up the pick those up, and yeah, I love that. I take my daughter crabbing out here in San Francisco just for the fun of it, and we yeah. give the we give the crabs we find to the other guys on the pier who are eating it. Uh, uh, but yeah, you know, culture is top down, and man, you know. Tasso, you've built a culture of bile and unethical behavior, and I hope the chickens come home to roost for you. That is my wish for you, Tasso. I hope that your business collapses and that your competitors and your former employees beat you in the open marketplace the way you deserve to be beaten. All right, Scott, good luck. We'll see you all uh, next time on Street Stars. Bye-bye.